similar story occurred in the state of New Jersey about 20 years ago. Well, greetings out there to all you lovely people. It's time for another episode of Radio Free Innsmouth, that being episode 266, in which we will be discussing a band that a decent chunk of you have probably heard of, and literally everybody else in the world except for me is wrong about them. Such a brave statement! Such a brave stance, you took! I mean, it's not easy being right about everything, but here I am. But seriously, you know, I've been listening to a whole lot of brutal death metal lately, and I don't just mean death metal that is also brutal brutal i'm talking about the actual legitimate subgenre of brutal death metal and this band has always been one of my favorites in that regard for the life of me i can't think of any other band that's had their output more misunderstood by the masses at large even amongst people that like them people that enjoy deeds of flesh the band we will be covering this week now if you listen to death metal even if you don't listen to deeds of flesh you're probably familiar with the name of the band because they've always kind of been a pillar of the whole brutal death metal movement a lot of that has to do with the fact that members of this band helped start Unique Leader Records, which is a pretty major label in the brutal death metal subgenre. Back at their inception, they were putting out all kinds of stuff I enjoyed, like Pyamia, Internal Bleeding, Disgorge, Mortal Decay. And even nowadays, when they put out a whole lot of stuff that I really couldn't give less of a shit about, like Archaic or Fallujah or Rings of Saturn. <laughs> Well, that just happened. They're also putting out stuff by Afterbirth and Vomit Remnants and Abominable Putridity. So I'd say, you know, that as far as like a modern death metal label goes, they're doing all right. But you're also probably familiar with Deeds of Flesh because they are one of the foundational brutal death metal bands. If you've never actually heard the term brutal death metal, it's not just death metal that is also brutal. It's a specific style. It can be a bit hard to define, kind of like utilizing the legal definition of obscenity. I might not be able to describe it, but I know it when I hear it, but let's call a spade a spade here, no offense. It's pretty much an entire subgenre of bands that are heavily influenced by the band's suffocation. Huh? You get it? Spade a spade? Because suffocation got a couple of black guys in it? <laughs> Classic joke. I kill myself sometimes. But yeah, it's an entire subgenre of death metal, pretty much all based around a heavy suffocation influence, specifically when suffocation do stuff like. And you could see how you'd be able to base an entire genre of music around that given how much shit was going on in there. And that sort of thing is become one of like the major hallmarks of brutal death metal. And Deeds of Flesh were one of the first bands after Suffocation to do that and one of the major bands involved in innovating the subgenre into what it has become today. But a lot of people, even including people that are into brutal death metal, seem to give Deeds of Flesh short shrift. For starters, there's a lot of purists that'll tell you, I only like the first Deeds of Flesh album, which, yes, great album, but yes, me, it ain't nowhere near their best. And then there's an even louder and more vocal contingent of people that say most of the Deeds of Flesh catalog demonstrates everything that is wrong with brutal death metal. Brutality for the sake of brutality, whole lot of technically complex riffs, none of it's very memorable, it's mostly just meant to beat the user into submission, which, one, that's actually called the band Disgorge, and uh, that shit's fucking awesome, so shut up. So yeah, this is what you get. And two, for reasons that will be made abundantly clear, that doesn't describe classic deeds of flesh at all, and I think a lot of people need to get their ears cleaned out. But even a lot of brutal death metal people will listen to deeds of flesh in their prime and be like, bro, where are all the slams? Where's the breakdowns? Like, that's a big part of brutal death metal, and like, I'm not hearing it. And to them, I say, you are fundamentally misunderstanding where deeds of flesh are coming from. Because yeah, brutal death metal comes out of suffocation, but as we mentioned earlier got a lot of parts like and there's literally like a million fucking bands doing stuff like that friggin pyrexia <laughs> reputilation one of my favorites vomit remnants And even fellow Californians, the aforementioned Disgorge. But if you remember the first time I played that suffocation riff earlier in the episode, there was a second half to it when a little something like... 
And it is that part of the suffocation equation that Deeds of Flesh took the most influence from and ran with it. You know, you got a billion fucking bands doing a billion fucking brutal death metal groove riffs. Not too many people are able to pick up on that second aspect of suffocation and successfully parlay it into their own style. I mean, even on their more conventional, earlier material, Deeds of Flesh were doing really cool stuff with bits like that. And the only reason I say more conventional is because Deeds of Flesh were there at the beginning to establish those conventions. I mean, this is from 1994, and it still sounds pretty fresh for modern brutal death metal today. If you pay attention to where the guitar playing is going, they're pretty much at the limits of how many different segments you can have to each riff before it kind of just deteriorates into chaos. I'd put them up there with the best of cryptopsy in that regard. And yeah, at this stage in their career, they do have some suffocation groove riffs, but they tend to hit and fade away into blasting a lot more quickly. And they're also, for lack of a better term, a little bit less groovy and a lot more abrasive than those same kinds of riffs would appear to be in a suffocation song. When it came time to do their first album, the classic Trading Pieces, they still had a bit of that latent suffocation style groove to them, and yet they were already clearly moving into sort of their own style of brutal death metal. And you can hear that very well with riffs like this one right here, where it comes in with this like very impactful sort of chug that is immediately followed up by what I might call a melodic death metal bit, in that it's death metal, but it's tremendous picked and it's clearly a very smooth melodic stream. It's death metal that's melodic without being, you know, the style melodic death metal. And a subtle sense of melody peeking through that sort of extreme technicality is what makes suffocation better than most other brutal death metal bands in my estimation. Certainly more intellectually engaging. And it's that sort of thing that Deeds of Flesh picked up on and ran with. When you get to the second Deeds of Flesh album, Inbreeding the Anthropophagi, you see Deeds of Flesh immediately establishing their own unique stylistic markers. For instance, that album title indicates that a whole lot of songs on this are actually sort of like a mini concept album about the Sawney Bean clan in 16th century Scotland. This was like a whole bunch of cannibalistic highwaymen screwing their sisters and living in caves and eating people. May or may not have actually happened, but for the purposes of being brutal death metal as fuck, we're gonna say that it did. This sort of usage of historical theming would become one of Deeds of Flesh's major trademarks. Even the songs that don't specifically deal with the Sawney Bean clan on this album tend to have their basis in more gruesome aspects of history. My personal favorite song on this one, Infecting Them with Falsehood, kind of takes the famous serial killer tale of Dr. Henry Howard Holmes in Chicago with his weird murder mansion and transposes that idea farther back in time to the medieval period. So you got this guy running like a castle full of traps for murdering people and then using those killings to get ahead in the stratified noble society that he so detests. This album features Deeds of Flesh's most technically complex material written to date, and yet it maintains that perverse sense of melodic cohesion, particularly during this little riff set, which is almost like a melodic staircase of sorts, going up and down these scale runs. It's like very evil Baroque chamber music, at least in my ears. Even the breakdowns like this bit here are a little bit less 0101 on the guitar neck and a little bit more kind of an interesting sort of melody, just broken up by the chugging bits. Also fucking love those vocals, brutal as hell. And here we go into a trademark Deeds of Flesh style riff, where you start out with a very simple sort of chug, and then respond to with a more melodic sort of tremolo picked riff. It's a very call and response type of thing. Through a total throwing the death metal guitarist down the stairs sort of transition into an even more melodic sort of tremolo pick section that gives Deeds of Flesh a chance to show off the different vocal styles. kind of like you have these different actors on this gruesome historical stage play communicating with each other and I find it to be you know kind of stimulating interesting you know you really have to pay attention to it to figure out what's going on it's intelligent without being nerdy or overly demonstrative and it's still brutal as fuck but after this album we get into what I would consider the classic era of Deeds of Flesh we're talking the late 90s through early 2000s core of Path of the Weakening Mark of the Legion Reduced to Ashes and Crown of Souls and oddly enough despite it being my favorite era of Deeds of Flesh this is the one that people seem to shit on the most as far as it being like 
like brutality for the sake of brutality and not having any catchy bits. Honestly, I couldn't disagree more, particularly when it comes to my favorite of this era, Path of the Weakening. This is another album that has sort of a historical context to it. In this case, the Path of the Weakening refers to hardships imposed by the harsh landscape of the American West upon settlers moving out from the Midwest to the West Coast, you know, getting killed off by all sorts of nasty diseases and having to resort to cannibalism on occasion. It's on this album they start to really go nuts with the melodic tremolo picked riffs running into weird jumbled dissonant combinations before heading back into those same melodies. Here it comes again. I never thought I'd use the phrase epic sense of melodicism so much to describe a brutal death metal band, but that's kind of where my brain goes when confronted with riffs like these. They even start to incorporate a little bit of guitar harmonization into parts like this one right here, adding an extra little layer of guitar melody to bolster what is already a very strong melodic concept, which then transitions to one of the greatest, catchiest, most memorable death metal riffs I've ever heard. I mean, did you hear that shit, bro? And this transition coming out of it is no slouch as far as memorable riffs go either. Lots of really cool transitions, weird rhythmic change-ups. So overall, yeah, Path of the Weakening, amazing fucking album. The main point I'm trying to make is people trying to tell me that this era of Deeds of Flesh is lacking in memorable songwriting when you got shit going on like... Are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? Starting to think a lot of people out there in the death metal scene don't really have. Or. What the hell's actually going on in music? In fact, I'm willing to bet that a lot of those people would try to tell me that that's a good Morbid Angel album. <laughs> Even the songs in the album that utilize a little bit more standard suffocation style groove still incorporate that hefty amount of tremolo picks melody in between the chugs in a very interesting way for transitioning into those more epic, melodic, focused kind of sections. Songwriting on this album is off the charts in terms of subtlety. For instance, this sped up section right here sounds completely chaotic at first, but then you pay attention to what the guitars are actually doing, and it's simply just another version of that melodic riff from earlier. They just kind of move their hand back on the neck and play it with a different strumming technique. It's really helped everything slide into this more dissonant, pinch harmonic focused section. All the dun 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 and stuff. And the weird warbly, quick hammer on pull off guitar playing before jumping right back into a counterpoint to those epic melodies. Every song on here has a whole fuckload of different sections, a whole lot of different stuff going on and interacting, but it all manages to maintain a level of narrative cohesion that you don't often find in bands operating at this level of technical complexity or riff density. And I think that's what really sets me off about people trying to tell me that Deeds of Flesh is not capable of writing memorable riffs. Because not only do they write incredibly memorable riffs, but they do so in a very difficult environment for that sort of thing. A lot of it has this sort of morbid waltz-like characteristic to it. It's just whirling streams of melody that, as mentioned earlier, result in some downright catchy guitar lines. Very memorable stuff, almost hummable. Da -na 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 -na. A lot of this succeeds because of the incredibly varied drumming capable of following along with all those guitar parts without getting too big into the Flo Mounier grandstanding and hot dogging type stuff. You know, I enjoy plenty of bands that do that kind of thing too. I'm just saying for Deeds of Flesh, a more subtle touch is required and I appreciate it when the musicians can pull it off. So as I mentioned earlier, this sort of album cycle of their third, fourth, fifth, and sixth albums tends to be under-recognized, but amongst fans that appreciate these, it seems like most people think that Reduced to Ashes is the best out of all of them. I myself am definitely something of a Path of the Weakening stan, but I think a lot of people overlook Mark of the Legion, the fourth Deeds of Flesh album, which continues the sort of historical lyrical focus of their prior efforts, including a dip into the Viking Age that is pretty much the exact opposite of the sort of bouncy fun music you might hear from Amon Amarth. Albeit it's still probably the most catchy melodic Deeds of Flesh ever got, particularly on this song, which features a wonderfully catchy main riff and is entitled An Eternity of Feasting and Brawling. Again, people tell me this band doesn't have catchy riffs need to get the fuck out of here, dude. Her counterpoint riff to that main riff fucking slaps too. It almost has sort of a black metal feeling to it. How heavily it's focused on these tremolo picked guitar melodies. But when we get back into that main riff, they get to show off how subtle their composition gets. Because they introduce an interesting little counter melody to the tail end of it. 
you hear that? That wasn't there the first time they played this riff, and it enables them to move the song forward into a completely new direction. After a suffocation style full stop, we get into one of the rare moments of a suffocation style groove riff, but still done with that weird deeds of flesh, unique melodic sense. Also, the production on this album is out fucking standing. It's a little bit thicker and kind of darker sounding than Path of the Weakening. But literally, for this style of deeds of flesh, you can't go wrong with Path of the Weakening, Mark of the Legion, Reduced to Ashes, or Crown of Souls. They're all excellent. And that was the world I was operating in way back in high school. I think I heard in breeding the Anthropophagi first. And then I kind of went forwards and backwards, back to trading pieces and forwards to Path of the Weakening onwards. And I was like, dude, I fucking love Deeds of Flesh. This band slaps. And then they finally have a new album coming out. The first new album that they ever made since I became a fan of them. It was coming out in 2008 and I was super fucking excited. I went out and bought it in a record store. And, uh... I fucking hated it. Like, what is this, the new fucking Spawn of Possession album? Could not stand it. And the most insulting thing about all of it was that people that weren't fans of Deeds of Flesh were telling me, oh, this is the first good Deeds of Flesh album I've ever heard. Glad they're not boring anymore. Like, what the fuck are you even talking about? The first thing you might have noticed there, fucking guitar solo in the sample. Now, you might remember when I was playing Deeds of Flesh in the earlier parts of this episode, uh, there weren't any guitar solos in the musical samples I chose to represent where their music was going. There's a good reason for that. It's because they didn't have guitar solos solos back in the day because they didn't need them. But now they're going to put blank spaces in the song's composition for these guitar solos to happen. Maybe that's why people back in the day thought that old school Deeds of Flesh wasn't catchy at all. It's because all their songs just flowed so naturally. It was hard to separate out any individual moments. However, as I have hopefully adequately demonstrated earlier on in this episode, Deeds of Flesh's songs were incredibly memorable back in the day, even with these really long form ideas. It's just, I don't know, people don't have the attention span to comprehend everything that's going on in that song. You see? You see? You're stupid mimes. Stupid. Stupid. And it's not just the guitar solos. It's kind of the whole general atmosphere of it. You know, like the sci-fi concept leading into all sorts of weird squiddly beat blap bloop blop random riffs and the fucking production just being like loudness focused and overly clinical sounding. Old school Deeds of Flesh had this real sort of like foggy, morbid atmosphere to it. Nowadays, it just sounds like they're producing it the same way you'd produce a modern Nile album, i.e. blech. And the worst part is... Is underneath all that studio gloss and all of these dumb guitar solos that don't need to be there and are taken away from the overall flow of the song, you can still kind of hear old school Deeds of Flesh going on underneath it. Like this right here, absent the production, could almost be an old school Deeds of Flesh rip. Like you feel like it's really building up to something interesting. What? Here comes this overly showy guitar solo in the ruin your fucking day. It completely halt any forward progression of that riff. So you just have to keep using it as fucking backing chords for somebody trying to be King Diamond for a while. Then when you get out of the solo, it gets even worse. Because yeah, they do build on that riff's ideas in the most annoying way possible, which is this like spazzy, random bleepy bloopy noise shit. Like, man, I can't fucking stand it. And everybody's trying to tell me that this is, like, way better than, you know, Path of the Weakening or something. Get the fuck out of here. But listen, you know this isn't me. I try not to be negative about music that often, usually, maybe. But at least on this program, I like to talk about bands that I like, doing stuff that I like. So instead of ending on that low note, let's check out what a lot of old school Deeds of Flesh fans consider to be the best Deeds of Flesh album, that being Reduced to Ashes. Which, yes, did kind of harken back to the technicality of inbreeding the Anthropophagi after the melodic explosion that was Mark of the Legion, but it's still got plenty of its own melodic moments, including this bit, which is probably the closest they ever got to melodic black metal, and there's a really fucking awesome memorable riff that contrasts beautifully with these, like, short, choppy musical phrases. All the songs on this album just have this really architectonic sense of majesty to them. Very epic stuff, and that actually reminds me a lot of Immolation, specifically in Close to a World Below, although, obviously, these guys resemble another band ending in Asian a little bit more particularly when they do change-ups like that. But as far as kind of being immolation-ish, they've even got a 12-minute long song on here, and it's not like six minutes of song, four minutes of silence, three minutes of farting around in the studio. No, it's an honestly got a 12-minute long song entitled The Endurance that manages to be interesting over the entire course of its mammoth runtime. Unfortunately, I was not able to endure the massive stylistic shift the of Flesh underwent in 2008, but I don't know, maybe you, maybe you like that stuff better than any of the Deeds of Flesh I'm really into. That's fine. You're 
wrong, but that's fine. I mean, even at their worst nowadays, it's certainly better than most of the musical junk food any given tech death fan will try to pawn off on you. No matter what your opinion is on the Deeds of Flesh question, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. This is all in drag, and it would be David Duke, uh, Ted Kaczynski, the, uh... And the Spence. And, oh yeah, and the Spence, baby. And, uh, we would... And the, the joke, the punchline would be that we're gonna build a bomb and set it off in a...